I've had the, the good fortune of meeting Eli, gosh, at least maybe five years ago, maybe more, and was always delighted whenever he was in the building and, and popped his head into my office for a chat. We, um, we really developed a rapport quickly and, and talked about all sorts of things. Um, Eli has graduated from the University of Illinois. He got all three of his degrees here in um, his PhD was in mechanical engineering. And he went to work at Caterpillar and um, worked at Caterpillar until very recently. So he really, he, he did the smart thing. He kept his day job until he knew he was in a position to be able to go out onto his own completely. And what I learned about Eli over the years is that he has, uh, he has family in the Southwest part of the country. He enjoys hiking and he has family, which I was surprised that um, actually are avid hunters, um, which was kind of interesting that surprised me. And um, that he has uh, a great interest in anything to do with fans. He's really all about fans, like fans that blow air and really wants to do stuff with fans. He's really intrigued by them. I don't know if that came from an early age, Eli, or not. We never talked about that, but I remember him saying, I'm just really into fans. <laughs> um, so a delightful young man and someone that I'm, I'm happy to call my friend and someone that has worked really hard and didn't hesitate to reach out. Um, sometimes I worried that he was reaching out to the wrong person by asking me questions that probably my colleagues were better um, qualified to answer, but um, someone that I've really enjoyed getting to know and really proud of the success that he's had. If you have a chance, um, Eli, I don't know if it's still up on your website or not, but if you go to his, um, go to the, the SNOOS website, I hope that you can still see the really enjoyable video or look for it on YouTube that you did for your, uh, your fundraising campaign, which was one of the more hilarious videos I've had the chance to see. Um, and you will probably recognize the actor that you hired as well, because I've seen him in other commercials as well on television. Um, SNOOS was um, the recipient of a lot of um, help from our director uh, or designer rather in residence and uh, Dina McDonough and had a lot of input from her and from some of her colleagues at other universities as well. And I know that along the way, the design of the product morphed and changed and that of course is not unusual, um, but a lot of the original uh, input came from our designer in residence. So I wanted to make sure to give a shout out to Dina for that. So, okay. No, thank you for that uh, that intro. I'm gonna share my screen and I'll kind of talk alongside it too. I mean, my, my thought was just to kind of give you our story, um, how we started. Um, definitely, if you have questions, let me know. Um, so, um, thanks for that introduction. So, yes, yeah, so our company is Snooze, um, and I'll walk you through kind of the slides, at least just how we first kind of started out. You know, and I'll, I'll say this before I begin. You know. I've, I've said this to many people that if I ever wrote a book about being an entrepreneur, and I don't think I ever will, but if I ever did, the title of the book would be It's a Lonely Place. And the reason I say that is because, you know, 50% of your days are probably in despair and thinking that like, man, this is just not going to work. You know, maybe more in the beginning. And, and even still, even in our certain states, probably 10% of my days are still in despair of thinking like, you know, I, I, I always think it's going to explode. I just don't know which direction. And, um, you know, you're, you're always wrestling with that. And a lot of most, just about all my friends, you know, have kind of stable jobs in, in either for companies or labs or something like this. And, you know, there's just a stability there that they have that has always been like a, maybe a barrier to relate to people. Uh, like not, not saying just, just I would have never understood this position unless I was on this side of the fence. I think that's how I want to say it. So it's, it's not necessarily, um, it's just the experience of it, I think, is always um, changes, you know, changes your perspective. So, the company um, is really two people. It's myself, um, and then I've got one partner who happens also to be my, my brother-in-law, um, Matt. So um, as, as was mentioned, so I, I worked at, I, you know, went to U of I, I was a mechanical engineer, and then post-graduation, I started at Caterpillar, um, right in town, right in Research Park. Um, and then my partner, um, so my brother-in-law was at Zappos.com. He, he was like an online marketing guy, so, um, that's kind of the team. So we kind of started this company back in 2015 is really well, say early 2015 is really kind of when we started. And, you know, the whole idea is a lot of people use white noise to sleep. A lot of people use fans in particular. So when I was in college, I mean, I, 
I didn't know anybody who didn't take a fan and point it at a wall and just run it at night because they like the sound the fan makes. So I can tell you personally, like I've gone to Target and like listened to the fans in the aisles. I've even traveled with fans in a suitcase because I was like so addicted to that noise of just helping me sleep at night. Um, however, we, as an engineer, it's kind of an awkward solution, right? Because fans are designed to move a lot of air with minimal noise and people are kind of trying to use them the opposite way. Um, so with that said, we, uh, we created Snooze, which was a, you know, a portable white noise machine, basically. So we've got a real fan inside and we wanted it to be a real fan because, you know, like there's a million ways you can kind of spin this, but the end is that, you know, it's relatable. If we tell people it sounds like a fan, there's always this kind of leap of faith where they have to kind of trust us that it's going to sound like what they want it to sound like. But if you tell them, Hey, it is a fan and they already use a fan. There's just like this, um, this instant like connection that they have with that, where they understand the product better. And that's kind of why we uh, kind of started out this way. Um, the device also kind of connects to an app. So the, the reason behind this is pretty simple. We wanted us to do this, a Kickstarter campaign and we pretty much, we felt like we had to have a techie kind of component to it. Other than that, I don't want to say I regret doing the app, but I wish we didn't do an app because it's, it's a real pain in the neck because you're constantly having to like, you know, keep up with the app and updates and people always have connection problems. It's, it's just kind of an unavoidable thing in particular on the Android side, which maybe I'll talk about a little bit later. So when we first started, um, you know, like I said, we kind of came with this premise that most people use fans pointed at the wall. So this is a Honeywell fan. This is probably the most popular fan on the planet. If I had to guess, I bet you they sell something like 5 million of these a year. They're so cheap, even Amazon has ripped it off and they have the Amazon Basics fan that looks identical to this. Um, and it's just because it's just like the number one fan. And the number one use of this fan, I can tell you with some certainty because we've spent so much time in this area, is sleeping. Like people just run it at night because they like the sound it makes. Um, to this day, well, it's, I, I should say, almost to this day, because I, I think we're about to kind of be in the same spot. But let's say from 2015 up until right now, we've actually never lived in the same place, me and my partner. Everything has been kind of screen sharing, FedExing, UPSing. Even now, like if I, we've got new products we work on and I'll actually like FedEx it to them. And, you know, we're always nervous too, like sometimes because you wonder if something's going to get lost in the mail. And so that's been a real hindrance. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's just unfortunate. It just kind of came across that I was, uh, my partner was born and raised in Las Vegas and that's kind of where he started his life out. And for me, it was, it was, you know, a different place. And we, we never, uh, we always had kind of like one foot in and one foot out. So we kind of tried to get the company going, I think just kind of through this method. Um, so these are actually some early prototypes, <laughs> a far difference, but you know, and it, it's, you know, we look at our product and not say our, this first product that we have out there right now, it's a really simple product. I mean, it looks really like a simple product, but, Fan acoustics is it's um it's almost like an art more than a science, which makes it a little bit more difficult on the engineering front because they're really not equations to kind of guide you. And then we're also stuck with this very kind of like difficult environment, which is the bedroom. You know, so for one, if if you know a person lays down at night, the room is really quiet. So you can pretty much hear just about every kind of every frequency you can hear it. And the second problem is, you know, most people who use our product or fan usually I mean, in some sense, it's like a sleep aid, you know? So, you know, if it doesn't, so people are probably a little bit more critical of it. So, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to really figure out like what's the right sound that people like and, and how to create that sound. Um, we simulated a lot. So at, at Caterpillar, I was fortunate enough um, that I, I worked in kind of the fan acoustics, fan airflow simulation space. That, that's pretty much what I did at Caterpillar for, for you know, like the, the few years, the several years I was there as we kind of launched this company. Um, and there's a open source kind of software that I was luckily trained in, which was open foam was called. And I was able to uh, kind of leverage some of that um, kind of built like a little home computer that I could run stuff on and, you know, try to really figure out like how to make the right sound. And, and that's kind of where we got to. So this is kind of the evolution of the product. So starting on the left, this was actually the first one of a CD. It was just made with a kind of a CD spindle. Um, and then it, it kind of shrunk over time. There, there's one more iteration that, uh, which is our current product right here, which you'll see in a second, but this shows kind of the evolutionary map. This is the one that we, the one on the far right is the one that we ended up going to Kickstarter with. And I'll go a little bit into detail on, on why we ended up switching our design post Kickstarter as well. Um, so our next step, of course, we, we got ready for Kickstarter. Um, and um, has it, you know, went well. So we, uh, we did about half a million in about 50 days on there. Um, that was in late 2015. 
And you know, if you ask us what, what, why do we do well on Kickstarter? I will tell you, I don't have a clue. Like it's, it's really hit or miss on Kickstarter. There was a really famous um, Kickstarter, which actually the company I think just went bankrupt maybe about six months ago called the coolest cooler. And they did, I think they were one of the record breakers. They did $13 million um, like in, you know, same time frame, say 50 days or something. But what most people don't probably don't know is they actually ran that campaign twice. The first time they ran it was six months previous. And it didn't, they didn't, they, I, they didn't even meet their goal. Like they raised, you know, like 80,000 or, or something like that. They ran it six months later, pretty much the same product, just a different color, made their video a little bit different and they raised 13 million. So, you know, how does that happen? I, I don't know, but there's a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of luck involved, I think. I mean, you know, I think having the right ingredients and the timing of the year all kind of add up, but it's a little bit of just kind of catching fire. We got almost no publicity. We had, reached out and we hired PR firms. We reached out just probably to a thousand different places and nobody would pick us up. And I, I think the reason was, is people were kind of skeptic, becoming more skeptical of Kickstarter um, back then. I think even more so now because, you know, like a, some kind of, you know, oh, like say Wired or Mash, but one of these guys, they get behind a product and then the, that company never fulfills and then it kind of reflects badly on them. Um, you also note here too, it says filled in early 2017. So we spent pretty much a whole year just trying to figure out how to make a the product. And I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, this is kind of an important slide. So post Kickstarter, uh, Matt and I became bro bro brothers in laws. I always say that wrong. Um, I think it's important because I think it's worth mentioning of who your partners are. I think that's a really important thing. You know, like I didn't realize how important I was until we started, but it's important to figure out like who are your partners and, you know, like, cause it's almost like a marriage. I mean, I, in a weird way, like I talk, well, I think I talk to my partner more. We probably, like if you add up the hours, we probably have longer and more conversations with him than I do with my own wife. And the reason is, is because, I mean, we're just that connected. You know, it's like the whole uh, business really hinges on everything. Um, in terms of production, we started in Malaysia. Um, and actually, this is a factory in Malaysia. And that was actually a really, that's actually one of the things that I probably enjoy most about. Um, starting the company was being able to see other countries and like, you know, just see what other people like how they view problems and how they work on stuff. And, and uh, I've been more and more impressed with other people and other countries as I've kind of visited them and see how, you know, how they tackle problems and, um, and just their willingness to just jump in and, you know, try to like, you know, no matter what, just to get the job done. So this was, um, yeah, like the, actually this, what I'm trying to so even right here, these are actually the big plastic molds at the bottom. If you can see my cursor the bottom, these are actually the big plastic molds that we, that they use for snooze. I don't think you can see any of the actual shapes in them. Um, anyway, and uh, the second part is we visit all our suppliers. So there was, um, I know in the intro we mentioned uh, Dina, who's been, a, you know, was a really big help to us um, in the beginning. And she connected us with, um, with Herbst, Scott Herbst and Walter Herbst, which maybe some people know. And, you know, when we visited uh, Scott Herbst, who helped us with our first design product, the one thing, you know, we were just looking for a supplier and trying to find, you know, where are we going to get this manufacturer? We looked in the U.S. and we looked in um, Malaysia and we looked in China and we looked in all three. Um, the one thing he told us is he goes, never underestimate face-to-face uh, -face diplomacy. And he was just so right on that. It's just for some reason going to your suppliers, just, you know, even if it's only like 30 minutes, even if you have to travel across the world to do it, it's just something changes in the relationship as soon as they see your face and they see that you show up in, you know, in their country or they show up in your, our country. It doesn't really matter. It's just as soon as that connection's made, it's like all of a sudden you just become serious with each other. And like, you know, it's like almost like a relationship starts forming there. So um, I'll, I'll mention this too, because it's probably really relevant now since there's, there's so much talk about, you know, U.S. production and stuff like that. So we made the decision to um, manufacture. We first started in Malaysia. Um, we did move to China, but it was like I tell people right in time for the trade war to start. And, you know, we tried to look in the U.S. a little bit and we even got some quotes in the U.S. Um, I'll tell a few things that might be worth interesting to some people, especially if they're in kind of this consumer electronics space is one, you know, a lot of factories in the U.S. actually wouldn't even quote us. They said, um, you know, this product, like this is not a U.S. made product, like this is not a product that should be made in the U.S. We did have a few that would quote us. But essentially, there's just a lot of common parts that you just can't find here. So like, you know, um, like a power supply, like uh, you probably see in the bottom corner, like a 12 volt power supply, 
to my understanding, there's not a single supplier of that in the entire United States. And if they do supply in the U.S., all they are is just importing it from somewhere in Asia themselves. And, you know, I, I don't necessarily think that has to be the way, but I think that's just the way manufacturing goes. You know, it's like, I mean, doing things in high volume is always beneficial. And, you know, so like in certain parts of the world, you know, like they started making power supplies and they did it really cheap. And, and then everybody flocked there and then they made them even cheap and even better. And then they became kind of the world supply for it. Um, the second thing was motors, you know, like um, we, you know, we use like a little 12 volt brushless motor and like, you just can't get those in the U S anywhere. I, I don't think, any, I mean, the only places we ever connected with that made them was a place out of California, but they themselves imported them from China themselves. And it was kind of triple the price. So the other thing too, I, we've learned, I've learned actually in traveling these places, you know, they've got a really nice, you know, network for manufacturing that, um, that's hard to find in the U S I don't know if you, I don't even know if we have it here. It's like, you know, you can go to like Shenzhen is the one area that we produce. In, and if you go there, like everything's in the same town. Like if you want a, you know, a power supply, motor manufacturer, circuit board maker, fabric makers, like they're all kind of down the street from each other. So you can really just go to one spot and you can just find everything you're looking for. Um, we do have some future products that we're coming out with, um, which I'll, I'll talk about those later. For those, like there's one in particular that I'm, I'm interested in, in doing it um, in the US, actually in Woodstock, Illinois, because there's a, a good factory up there that I like, but it's gotta be the right product. You know, um, when you have a lot of electronics and stuff, it, sometimes I just don't think it makes sense, at least, if it's kind of like a mid, lower to mid range consumer electronics, which I think is what our product kind of is. Um, so inspecting parts. So, you know, we spent a lot of time looking at parts. I mean, it sounds, this picture looks ridiculous that you'd be looking at this fan blades this closely, but you know, like, um, so I'll tell you, so I say this two ways. So one, we had one production run once um, out in China actually, where, we, we got like 10,000 units in and there were a lot of problems with the units. The fan blades were all vibrating like a lot. They just kind of got, and they were just mistakes. Like, you know, like things weren't assembled correctly or with enough care. And there were two lessons. There's a the one guy that kind of manages the factory. We've kind of become real friendly with, and he told us two things. One, he said, um, you should use a third party. Um, you should use like a third party inspection place. So they have places that will kind of go to the factory on your behalf and kind of inspect each production run. Like you tell them what to look for. And he told us, you know, it's not necessarily like, uh, it's just, you know, the, and I kind of learned this at the factory floor, right? These are just average workers. They don't really have an invested interest in your company. And sure, they want it, they want to keep their job and everything, but they're not as particular as you are. So, you know, you have to, and if they know nobody's looking and nobody's checking, there's always just going to be a downside of quality. So like you have to inspect, they have to know that you're serious. Like you shouldn't let, and we've learned this the hard way, which I'm, I'm, I'll show you in a slide or two that like, they have to know that you are borderline, like, you know, borderline over the top on inspecting parts and catching everything. It's the only way really to keep the quality. I think really good. The second thing we learned is you don't produce around Chinese new year. So we did that once, uh, like, you know, we had a, a production run that was ending right before Chinese New Year, and there were all kinds of problems we had too. And what we were told was, you know, look, when Chinese New Year comes, uh, like, you know, 100% of the factory workers go home to their kind of their hometown, 70% come back. So there's a lot of people that know that's their last week. And they said that everybody's minds are kind of checked out and people are just trying to get through stuff and get out. And a lot of people know they're not coming back. So we, we were told always avoid kind of producing around those range. Um, around that time range. Um, so Kickstarter. So, um, you know, we were at the uh, disadvantage. I think that we were trying to be really scrappy and we didn't have a lot of ways to kind of fulfill everything. So um, our, uh, like basically our in-laws have like a gym kind of area that they built onto their home in, uh, in Bourbon A, Illinois. So we had 7,000 units to, uh, to produce so, or to, that we produced and to fulfill on Kickstarter. So we actually shipped, I'm sorry, I take that. It was 10,000 units we produced, 7,000 Kickstarter. So we shipped 10,000 units to a small home in Bourbon A, brought them in carton by carton. So 10,000 units, it's about two pounds a unit. So it's 20,000 pounds of units, right? So that's about 10 tons. So like we actually literally inspected the floor as we said here <laughs> to make sure that it could hold 20,000 pounds. Um, but it took us probably three or four days. I think we spent $75,000 in, uh, in postage. Um, with the post office who had no idea what was going on because Bourbon A is not a tiny town, but it's kind of like, 
you know, still a small town, I think. And they had no idea why 7,000 packages came in and, you know, just a matter of like two or three days, but it was a, uh, it was a ride and it was actually probably good because a part of this process we hand inspected myself. I probably, well, over the course of the whole business, I bet you I've hand inspected six or 7,000 units, but with Kickstarter, I definitely inspected, you know, probably the bulk of that, at least two or 3,000. Um, and, uh, I'll tell you, this is kind of inside knowledge, but we did have a problem when our, our first time we, we, uh, produced it, we found out that it was a little bit susceptible to, um, ESD electrostatic discharge, right? So, you know, if, especially in winter time, if, you know, you kind of build up a little bit of static on your hands or something and you shock something, well, we just, you know, we didn't, we, we found this out right when we produced 10,000 units, like right when 10,000 units landed on our doorstep and we were kind of like inspecting the units it was in uh it was in the winter time and it was just on that certain carpet we had noticed like well like if we shock this unit like i think we shocked it once or twice accidentally and we noticed after that like the unit pretty much died out so we fixed i mean just an enormous number of units literally had to hand disassemble them ourselves put them back together um just to try to make them as robust as possible and and we you know we did we had some warranty claims too i think that we took on as a result of that as well. Um, this was actually more for investors, this slide, but it's just giving you a feel of how kind of a uh, hodgepodge it was. Um, so post Kickstarter, we started to sell on Amazon and on our own website. So uh, Amazon's been a really uh, a roller coaster of a ride. So I, I don't know if I, maybe I'll save it for, uh, I'll save that for in a few slides more. I'll tell you more about that. Um, and the reviews, which at the time I just kind of expected, oh, like we're gonna have a lot of great reviews. But I, now looking back on it, I, I realized that we were quite fortunate that people actually like the product because a lot of products fail and you really don't know, you might think you love it. You may give it to a hundred people who tell you they love it, but until you really kind of put it out there, like you really don't know. And, uh, and people are brutal. Like they will be brutal, especially if you're charging them $80, they're going to be especially brutal. And, um, so I think you always got to be ready for that. And like, I actually can tell you this, I don't re read reviews ever. My partner does, but I never read a single review. Um, and the reason is, is because like, I feel like I'm too close to the product. So it's like, I don't wanna say it's hard to read, but it's kind of like, you know, that criticism, like in the beginning, like occasionally uh, I read like a few reviews and I'd catch a bad review and I, it literally like the whole day I'd feel down about it, you know? So I don't think I've read a review in over a year at least. And I, I think between, I know on Amazon, we have over 2000 reviews. I don't, I have not read a review in probably two years. I take it back. Um, we've also sold to hotels. So that's, that was actually a surprise. We, we didn't expect to sell to hotels at all. So um, what had happened is right when we did our Kickstarter campaign, right after it ended, we got a call, uh, an email from uh, Four Seasons in Austin, Texas. And the guy requested 300 units. He said like, I want you know units for my entire hotel. We actually thought the guy was joking. So we actually kind of blew off the conversation. We just, we didn't think he was actually serious for like, you know, we thought it was maybe like some uh, low level guy or something like that, that was just saying this, but that, and, but he persisted and eventually they sent us a purchase order and they actually bought them. So to this day, we've, we've sold, I think to about 2000, we're in about 2000 hotel rooms right now. Um, the you know, COVID actually completely decimated the, the hospitality business. So, um, We've gotten like one order, I think, through the and since kind of the COVID thing hit, but we had a number of canceled orders too. Not fully canceled, just delayed. They just said they want to wait till everything kind of stabilizes a little bit, but I'll talk more about that. Um, so we're actually over this. So I, I'd say, you know, we're probably approaching 100,000 units at this point that we've sold. Um, but, you know, I never, I don't take anything for granted um, because, you know, competition's kind of always, I think, on our heels, especially kind of in the space we're in consumer electronics. Um, so, uh, we worked out of our garages all the way until, um, October of 2019. So I quit Caterpillar, my partner and I both quit our jobs in, um, April of 2019. So that was my last day was end of April, 2019. And we pretty much ran stuff in our garages all the way until October of 2019. Um, in October, we opened up a warehouse in, uh, in Las Vegas, actually, um, which is where my partner lives. The, the reason we did that, um, we... We actually were considering Illinois pretty significantly, um, but there were a few reasons that we ended up choosing there. One, so one thing we learned is, you know, and people should probably all <laughs> entrepreneurs understand this or is that 
uh, home mortgage loans don't easily come to, uh, to new companies. So I, I've learned this, that if you own more than 25% of your company, they actually, um, even though we're a C corporation, doesn't matter. Like we're, if we own less than 24%, 25%, we're considered an employee and all they care about is, you know, your W2. But if you own more than 25%, they care about the actual company and the financials of the company. And, you know, and they've got pretty, I think, rigorous standards, um, maybe some small banks, but big banks for that way. The other thing too is Illinois, is, you know, um, champagne or Banier is, is phenomenal. Like, it's been really a phenomenal place, but when we really start to kind of like scale up and stuff, um, you know, like some States provide some other, you know, provide some different advantages. Um, Nevada was good for us because, you know, like, a at least for like wages and stuff, it was probably a pretty easy place to kind of like, you know, attract talent, but at kind of a competitive wage. I, I think Illinois probably has, um, you know, very good talent here. And maybe one day we may come back to Illinois, if that's a possibility. But um, for now, that's kind of where we're at. Um, so this is just, uh, you know, kind of an image, I guess, of like, this is literally how we did it for our Kickstarter. So these were all just literally had a truck come by and just drop pallets on the driveway and brought them in one by one. Um, I mentioned here running out of stock, right? So we actually ran out of stock. I bet you we've run out of stock 10 times since, and longest probably was for several months. So, which is always a difficult thing. So, you know, for investors, like I've learned is they never like hardware companies as much as they like software companies because it's just so cash intensive because, you know, you know, if you want to produce 10,000 units, especially when you're first starting out, you can't get good terms with a factory. So you pretty much got to come up with all that cash up front. And, you know, and then let's say you produce it in overseas or something, you know, it takes a month, right, for it before it's going to arrive um, in the US. And then by the time you sell it, and by the time you recoup some of that money, it just, you know, there's just a long runway, it might be like a six month gap from the time when you pay for a unit to you actually recoup that money. So, you know, that takes a lot of effort. Um, and then, you know, hire help professionals. So part of these slides I, I used to use as a pitch deck. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about our products. So um, just give you a little more details. Um, and this is kind of where we started, but it's kind of where we're going. Um, so um, we sell our main product pretty much just on Amazon, our website. We've ventured out into other, some other spaces um, since this, I kind of last updated this presentation. So like, you know, we did like Good Morning America, uh, the deals and steals about, about a month ago we did them. Um, and then we've done, uh, we're doing Nordstrom in retail um, just this winter. We, we just, actually they reached out to us. That's gonna be a new thing. We don't, we don't know about retail. We, we were kind of cautious about it, but we thought like um, we kind of been wanting to kind of get into that space a little bit. So I don't know where that's gonna go, but that's just something new. And then, like I said, hotels, probably about 2000 hotel rooms right now. The biggest customer has been Four Seasons by far. The bulk of it's them. And then um, the Grand Hotel in Las Vegas, we've got, um, I think they've got about 600 rooms that we've, we've got filled. So those have probably been our two biggest customers, but then, you know, there's still kind of room to grow there. Um, the app, so uh, like I said, it's, um, you know, we've kind of did this app reluctantly. I think it was, it made sense for Kickstart. I don't know if it made sense beyond that, but it's pretty much basic functions, you know, like you do on off scheduler, this sort of thing. Um, it surprisingly gets decent use. I mean, at this point, it probably gets used 5 million times a year. So I, I usually track sessions. So I've got an idea of how many times people use it. Um, so it, to our surprise, actually people use it more than they want. So these are, um, these are actually uh, two new products. And, um, and actually there's a, there's a good point on the slide, which I'm gonna make in a second. So this is Snooze Go. So this is kind of like, we, you know, what we wanna do is we wanna kind of try to get into different, um, we want to get into kind of different spaces, different price points. Um, the downside of having a single product is you're absolutely glued to the sales of that product. Like if you have a bad day, well, that's it. That's everything. It's like, there's nothing else to like kind of cheer you up and say, well, okay, well that product didn't do well today, but this product did really great. So it's always like nerve wracking. I think having one product out there because you're just so glued to the sales of that product. So, you know, we've kind of like, try to identify the spaces and where we think we could create other products that are non-cannibalizing um, of our main kind of our flagship products. So Snooze Go, um, this is actually gonna come out in about, I think about one to two weeks. So it's, and I think there's a nice note up here that it says Q1 2020, um, which I actually forgot to update, but that really shows, I mean, that's, so, you know, think about how far behind we are, right? And, and I think I've modified that even 
another time to say Q1 2020. If you asked me when we first started this project, when I think we were gonna get it, I would have told you it would have been in 2019 sometime. So it's actually, we've been working on this for two years, believe it or not. It's just, you know, sourcing the fabric and sourcing, you know, the, the strap and the speaker and the battery and making sure you've got all the certifications for the battery. And then, you know, we kind of didn't want a lot of these white noise machines kind of create um, white noise like with uh, recording. And we wanted it to be algorithmic, like an algorithm that's kind of creating it on a processor just so it sounds as pretty much like as premium as possible. Never as good as kind of the real, uh, kind of our, our fan base product, but and then we also wanted a Bluetooth audio streaming so that it could kind of be like, like I say, the ultimate travel speaker. Um, and then we also created this other one, Snooze Button, which is about a month behind this one. Um, and the way it started out, I'll tell you, that this, you know, this is kind of a, just the way things go is we actually, we never had this product in mind. We had this product in mind with the, with the single button in front and then there are buttons in back for the controls. But what we learned is when we tried to make this small enough that it was a travel speaker, that we thought this button rocked like when a person pushes down on it, the whole unit would rock. So we ended up having to grow this one to the point that we didn't think it was a travel speaker anymore. So we ended up kind of coming up with a new design, but we really liked this button up front. So we made that kind of our, our another product. So anyway, that's basically how we kind of came to this, um, the product roadmap. We are also um, working on some like real fan products. Um, and if you want to ask what I think where we're, long-term, our long-term vision is, you know, when I first started, I used to always have ideas on, you know, like fans, like, you know, I want to, oh, we can do, well, let's make like, um, you know, we could do bathroom exhaust fans, we could do ceiling fans, we can do these kinds of fans. But over time, what I've really learned is no, like stay focused, like for one, it, it makes it easier for another company to acquire you. And two, it, it keeps your company, it keeps kind of like the mission focused too. So now we've kind of centered on this idea is like we we're interested in fans or we're interested in airflow we're interested in sound maybe temperature but if it's not inside the bedroom we have no interest in it like that's our only that's our space is the bedroom space and like we have no interest outside the bedroom like i don't care how good of an idea i have how good of a product it is i'll write it down i'll put it in the book but if it can't exist in the bedroom and it's not in the space of like air sound and temperature like i just move on like i don't even get bogged down by anymore and I, I think that's really helped a lot. Um, market size. So this is kind of, I think this is, I, the point I want to make on the slide is when we first started out, like we were looking for funding, angel, you know, angel investment funding. And one of the top questions everybody wants to know is how big is the U S market? What's the U S market size? And I was always like, I pretty much just focused on this section when I used to pitch it to investors that say, well, you know, it's about 11 million people. And they'd all say the same thing. Well, you know, the market's too small. And I can tell you of all the angel investment pitch events I've done, 90% of them have failed. Almost none of them. I mean, now it's like, we don't do really do them anymore, but like towards the end, it started getting better. But in the beginning, it was 100% were failing. Um, and the people always said the market's too small, the market's too small. We don't think this is ever can be a legitimate business that could really take off. Um, However, <laughs> over time, I've recrafted the argument. And I'm just like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to play it safe anymore. I don't care what people think. I'm just going to tell people what I actually think the market is. And this is what I actually think, you know, but I was always kind of thought people wouldn't believe us. So I just kind of focused on this side. So I added in kind of the bold idea of how big I actually think the market could be. And um, everybody, nobody's ever balked at it. Everybody's always said, wow, that's great. Like, there's so much potential. Like, why, what do you guys need to push harder? So the lesson learned was like never to kind of undersell yourself, even if you think like, you know, people might not believe it just to go for it. I mean, I've learned that probably painfully because I, I think if I started with this idea, we would have done better. Um, competition, you know, so I mean, we've learned a lot about competition. And um, one of, you know, these are kind of like one of the real challenges for our company, more so I think than, you know, companies that are not in the consumer electronics spaces is there's a ton, especially with Amazon, there's a lot of uh, like, I call them like Alibaba resale companies. So, you know, there's a lot of factories and we get solicited by them all the time. Um, and, and most of them are in China that will email us and say like, hey, like here are like 10 standard products. Um, like if you guys would like one of them, we'll customize it a little bit. We'll wholesale it to you, you guys sell it. So we're not interested because we, we want to build like our own products and our own brand. But there's a lot of that going on. And there's a lot of people who just, will buy those products and then just dump them on Amazon. And they're really cheap and they're never going to work right. And they're going to break. And in my opinion, they're probably not even safe because, you know, like uh, 
you know, like I can tell you like FCC certification, I can tell you right off the bat, that's a pretty much self-certified process. So most of the stuff you buy on Amazon does not pass FCC. It's, it's dumping out all kinds of crazy frequencies in people's home. That's probably interfering with all kinds of stuff and you don't realize it even. And a lot of the components are probably really cheap and they're going to break over to like, you know, in six months or something like that. But it doesn't really matter because we're up against those people. And there's so much um, fake reviews on Amazon. Like we've never cheated. I'd like to think we're like a white hat company. Like we just don't cheat on reviews, even though, but even though I think we've been cheated against at times, because you'll have competitors who will like kind of like uh, leave bad reviews on your product. And we know they are because of course they'll say things like I bought it, you know, we bought that product in target or something and it was terrible. Like, well, we know we don't sell on target. So we know that's not possible. But these are your competitors, and that's kind of the platform I think you have to go against. Um, I'll, I'll mention this one other story about Amazon because I think it's, it's relevant if anybody ever wants to get in the space. This was in, I think in July of this last year, we all of a sudden had like a huge dip in our sales. And we were like, and it was just on, um, it was on one of our colorways, the, the kind of the gray, the lighter gray color. And we were like, we couldn't figure out what was going on. We eventually figured out that our product got flagged on Amazon as an adult, explicit adult product, right? So when that happens, you automatically get delisted from the bestseller list and you're automatically restricted on what kind of advertising you can do. Um, it took us two weeks to get it sorted out with Amazon. So I, we think we lost like twenty, thirty thousand dollars from that. But it's what we've also learned is it's a common tactic of competitors to flag your product as an adult product. So it happens. And like it's it was not a glitch on Amazon side or anything like that. It was a competitor that did it. We don't know which one, but that's kind of the stuff you're up against, you know, and, um, and a lot of these guys, I don't want to say which ones, but some of them will pay for reviews. So like, I tell you, like, uh, I, there was a nightlight I bought like about a month ago to kind of like just take it apart and look at it. And when I got the product on Amazon, there was a card in that said it was $20. I paid for the nightlight. There was a card that said, um, if you leave us a five-star review, um, we will send you a gift card um, from Amazon for $18. So, and the game is, is that, you don't care if you take heavy losses in the beginning, you build up your reviews and then you just basically stop that. And then it's kind of like a money-making machine from that point forward. Um, we've never engaged in that stuff. We've always tried to play it straight, which we think is going to pay off. Um, patents. So, you know, we've done patents. Okay. And we've done trademarks. We've done all that stuff. The truth is, I don't know if any of it was worth it. Like, I just don't know because, you know, like uh, this one investor, been kind of a real mentor to us told me once you know he's like when you get a patent all you're doing is you're uh you're you're fighting for the right to be able to defend yourself so you know i mean are we going to do that it's you know probably not I, I think the best patent in the world i think there's two patents that are the best that don't cost anything one is a brand because you know like you know dyson right we think of a company like dyson like people just want to buy dyson because it's a dyson like that just means something i mean and even if somebody, and there's tons of knockoffs of the bladeless fans, but they're not Dyson. So like, you know, so I think if you can build up like a brand identity, that's a great patent. The other great patent is the, the app, which I didn't, you know, I regretted doing the app in the beginning, but it's really a phenomenal patent because there's a lot of people who might copy your product. There's very few people that are going to create an app and then maintain it because, you know, that's kind of like always an ongoing battle. Um, so potential, potential exit companies. So like, you know, this is something that's always on our mind is like, you know, like, what are we doing with this company? Are we running it to like, you know, build it to like, you know, 100, 200 employees? Or are we building it for somebody to buy, to buy us out? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but we're always thinking about if we ever did want to get bought out, who would be a company to buy us out? And uh, we've probably had conversations with most of these companies over the time. Not necessarily that they're in the right spot uh, to, to that we're in a spot to be bought out or that we even want to be bought out. I don't even know if we want to at this point, actually, but that, you know, it's always on our mind. And I know as we even engage with investors, it's probably top of their mind. It's like, who's going to buy you? What's your exit strategy? Um, and then I'll, I'll pause for questions or anything. Let me, um, so that's kind of a, that's kind of our overview, at least how we started. And it's been a, it's, it's been a really up and down road quite a bit, actually. <laughs> Not really sure uh, what's coming as I, I mean, the truth is it is, I do think we're going to explode. I, I just don't know which direction. And I mean that. <laughs> um, any questions or anything or other areas or I can probably keep talking. I, I don't even know when this is supposed to end actually. How about that? <laughs>
Is it? We've is got it on? one o'clock, Eli, but we'll see if okay. we get okay. it back, back <laughs> from participants. I know Cynthia and I are both proud owners of Snooze, first generation, so excited. Well, to I'm see glad you. they're still surviving. <laughs> you know, yeah. they've gotten nothing even improved. You know, and I, I will not, I'll mention to you, I mean, you know, if I didn't, if I wasn't in Champagne, it probably wouldn't have happened, Snooze. I mean, I, I do mean that because, you know, like I said, when we first started, like if I, if I was going to name a book, I would call it It's a Lonely Place because, you know, it feels daunting in a sense. And like, I think the only thing that kind of makes it like manageable is like having some kind of like support behind you that like, I mean, you need that. Like, I mean, you know, that's how we started really is like, it was actually just networking. Um, it was like, I met one person who met another person that introduced me to another person that introduced me to Enterprise Works. And that's, I mean, that was before even Kickstarter started. So, I mean, I, I've learned to, um, there's a lot of value in that, more than I probably would have ever thought, actually, you know. <laughs> I mean, looking back, I'm just reflecting back on that. I mean, I can probably say with full honesty, if I was in, you know, another city that probably didn't have that, I'd probably be working at Caterpillar still. I mean, I, I mean that with full honesty. So um, anyway, so there's something to say there too, I guess. <laughs> I think you actually have some of your old Caterpillar colleagues that have joined into this right? oh. <laughs> probably celebrating you as an entrepreneur that came from the Champagne office. Um, hey, Eli. hey, Anne. <laughs> Anne, do you have any questions for Eli? So, any <laughs> cross for me, literally, like, I and mean, we used to uh, talk about all kinds of things, not just <laughs> entrepreneurship, but uh, anyway, it's good. To, I'm glad you're kind of joined in. <laughs> Although yeah, you're glad to see you're doing well. <laughs> well, so you're not coming back, right? It looks looking like it's not. You're not coming back to us. <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, I I have no idea what's in store for the future. I, I'd say I we, I'm working like I'm not coming back, but I just don't know what comes next. You know, like I don't foresee us coming. I don't foresee me ever like coming back. I don't want to come back, but uh, <laughs> I don't know what comes next. I mean, it's it's a really rocky road. You know. Um, I mean, like I say, like, even when, when this whole COVID thing, like, I remember, like, I talked to my partner, I was like, all right, like, you know, I mean, we, one of the wisest things we ever did was build a financial forecast, um, which was really Sarah Ventures who really pressed us to do that and kind of helped us uh, put one together. And uh, I mean, we, before we had a forecast, we would literally, like, it was literally like gut feel, like, do you think we can afford that? I don't know. But we, and we literally had times when, like, <laughs> we would, like, have the factory would send us a bill and say, okay, you send us this amount of money. And like, we literally would like use like, <laughs> like we'd say, okay, let's don't reply for like a day. And then like when we reply, let's say it's going to be a few more days because we knew we had money coming in. I mean, it was that we'd have to almost play a, a game to try to afford things. But now that we have a forecast, like we can kind of we try to predict three years out, like do we have enough runway three years out? And we try to put a lot of cushion in there. So, but when COVID happened, like I literally chopped our forecast in half because my partner who is still had friends at Zappos, you know, they said like, yeah, like, you know, like consumer market pretty much just shut off 50%. Not that people weren't buying. I think people were just paying attention to other things. Um, luckily though, things have actually, I mean, we've actually had the strongest summer that we've ever had actually. Like, I mean, it was, I mean, we're like actually like restored our forecast fully like of pre-COVID. And I think that was because we suspect it was because there was a lot of extra money out there. That's what we think is that at least for our, I mean, we, we've got kind of like a higher end product. So like, um, and people weren't traveling and they weren't doing, they weren't going on to eat as much. So we, we actually saw that there was a little bit of a bump, we think in the consumer market, but I don't take that for granted. You know, I mean, I just don't know what's coming next. So anyway, <laughs> so to answer your question, I don't think we're coming back. <laughs> well, on our entrepreneurial side, we're, we're hoping that you are wildly successful with your own company, even though we're happy that it has ties back to Caterpillar and hopefully helped you become a better modeling and simulation engineer to design a better product. Locally, you talked about that Sarah Ventures is one of your investors. I think Irish Angels um, was another investor and you had to break through the clutter of not being a software company, quote unquote, even though you had an app and other um, technology that was certainly driven by um, computing can you talk to a little bit of advice to entrepreneurs? Um, you said it's lonely being an entrepreneur and I think it's even lonelier in hardware sometimes, but we've had some good success stories. What would you tell somebody who wants to build a physical product of 
um, how to talk to investors, how to approach it when everybody just keeps telling you software? Yeah, um, you know, like I, I think you've got to, uh, you know, for, so if you, I think a few thoughts. Like one is um, really staying focused on who your pro, who your consumer is. I think that was a mistake I made early on. Is like I was always trying to pitch investors of like, hey, here are all these ideas. Like, look how smart we are. Like, we can do this, and we have an idea on this. And like, the story becomes kind of muddied, even if you're like, even if it's true. And like, and I think a lot of those ideas about fans and stuff are actually now coming to fruition, but it doesn't even matter because I think when you're pitching in there, you know, there's a lot of investors who uh, want kind of like a unified story of like, here's our approach, here's our market. Um, the other thing I think was identifying exit companies, which we never even thought about an exit company. Actually, they used to talk about investors would ask like, what's your plan for an exit? And I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, we're just going to build a company. Like why we want an exit. But that's, even if you don't want to sell your company, <laughs> I think they need to hear that because they, they want an end point to their money when they're going to see a return on their money. And maybe if it's not an exit, it's like, I know you can also say like, well, we're going to give dividends or something like this, but I don't think it's as appealing to them. Um, third thing I've learned is that um, you got to be prepared for it. Like, you know, if you go to these kind of broad pitch events, especially like when you're first starting out, I feel like there's like kind of like the premium angel investor group pitch events and then there's like kind of the lower level one. the lower level one might just be like people who really aren't like haven't really don't have like invested in anything in particular but they're just like local people who have, maybe are retired and they have extra money and they kind of want like kind of just interested in getting some a lot of people will you know fortunately like you got and you got to play the game like but you got to be prepared to have your time wasted um and you got to be willing to do that like there's like the humble pie you got to eat some of it you know like there was one time i was my worst experience ever was actually in Chicago. I won't tell what group it was. It was right when we were starting out. It was like in downtown Chicago. I had to drive to. I mean, it was a big headache. Like, I mean, really downtown. So I had to like, you know, park. And like, I remember I had to get my car washed at a parking garage in order to get a spot. Because it was so hard to get a spot. It was the only way they'd I could park my car there is if I agreed to have them wash it while I was, at, while I was being parked there. And I went up to, I pitched. And, you know, people write down who's interested. And there was a whole bunch of people who said they were interested. And we're going to have a follow-up call. Follow-up call was scheduled. And I dialed in. And not a single person dialed in. It was, like, literally just me and the woman who organized it. And she was like, I am really sorry. She was like, I just don't know what happened. And I never heard from him again. But, you know, you got to be prepared for that. <laughs> you know, because I, I think it's, in some sense, it's almost like uh, it's just part of the game. Especially in hardware. Because it is. It's, it's capital intensive. There's a lot of competition. A lot of people fail at it. Um, there's, you know, manufacturing. It is very, it's a very difficult space, I think, to get in. But so I think, uh, you know, unified story, figuring out your, your exit companies, um, definitely having like as good of a prototype as possible. That it's something that looks probably good enough that a person could actually use it, buy it in a store. I think those are all really important. Um, and then, uh, you know, probably just having the, the right person to guide you through it, having a mentor. I mean, I've had a few mentors that really helped a lot, you know, um, but um, Tim at Sarah Ventures was a, one that has been just an enormous mentor. And like, you know, even when we had those disappointments, I mean, he would always say like, you know, I mean, he'd always kind of urge you to keep going. And one of the things he told me right when we first met, he said like, pretty much don't, regardless of how much money you think this is going to take, it's going to take a lot more. And he has been right, you know, 10 times over with that statement. I mean, it's just, so whatever idea you're pitching for and whatever money you have in your mind that it's going to take, you should probably do 10 X. And that's probably more realistic of like for the first several years, because you know, we thought several times we had enough and we always find ourselves, well, it's, if you're growing, it's harder. If you're stable, it's, it's easy. But you know, if your production ones are doubling and tripling in size, you just need more and more money. And the, when you get into like a retail space or even with Amazon, there's just a long lead time before like you get your product there and before the money comes back to you. And, you know, so you got to be ready for that as well. And, and banks really probably won't talk to you. We actually finally got a bank line of credit issued um, about six months ago, but for the first five years, I mean, we were like, nobody would touch us. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> we have um, Professor Vonka has a, a comment he would like to make. We're well acquainted. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, Kathy, can you unmute him? I, I, I'm unmuted. There we go. Great. Hey, Professor. Really nice to see you. 
Yes. And I just want to mention for the audience, uh, 10, 12 years ago, I guess Eli took a course with me on CFD and we <laughs> had a project. And I still remember the fantastic presentation that he had made and that is the vocal cords simulation <laughs> of, remember Eli, I think okay. you remember that. Right, you made a nice video and that shows his love for acoustics. And I'm very glad to see that eventually it made you, I don't know, billionaire or millionaire so far. It made you a millionaire. <laughs> but it, it, all with, it all started with your CFD and then you went to Caterpillar, did CFD, and then eventually came to this product. So it's very nice to see these things evolve. <laughs> no, thank you, Professor. Um, yeah, no, well. You've uh, you've been a part of the story, no doubt. That's right. I, I do remember that, uh, like teaching me. CFD. I don't want to take any credit other than you did a very good project. That's all I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that, but I think there is some credit, and I, I do appreciate. I mean, no, there's no doubt. Like I reflect me back. I mean, like I say, I mean, the, kind of the network and champagne and the instruction I received at U of I, and you know, even discussions I had with you know colleagues at Caterpillar. I mean, it's all kind of, kind of like tied into the moment that we're at right now, which, you know, is still kind of unfolding, um, for better or worse to be determined. <laughs> yeah, no, glad to see you so successful. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. I look forward to staying in touch too. I know we used to, he used to like, we used to meet at Caterpillar all the time and talk about collaboration projects and stuff. And, you know, unfortunately big companies, um, you know, they, they just got, it was just are all- you in Are you in Champagne still? Are you I in am in Champagne, yeah, I'm in Champagne still. Oh, but we can then meet sometime. I, sure. I, I, t I tell my partner, like, we have 12 months where we have to be in the same space. So the clock is ticking because it's just become just entirely burdensome that he's there and I'm here. Like, I mean, just beyond measure. I mean, like, just relying even on, like, the, uh, you know, the post office just to send things back and forth to each other. They're not going to lose something. I mean, like, even yesterday, we have a new product I haven't shown here, which is kind of more in the fan space. And I've been working on a I've been working on a prototype literally since uh, November of 2019. So it's almost been a year. I finally got it to a spot I was happy with and I shipped it to him. And I just, for like two days, I was on edge just that FedEx wasn't going to lose it. <laughs> like it arrives to the wrong person's door and they're like, well, what is this? This is interesting. <laughs> like, so those things are getting kind of ridiculous at this point. But <laughs> see you, Eli. I have to teach some more kids the same CFD. So I'm going to go out. All right. No <laughs> Thank you. Nice yeah. to you. A pleasure. <laughs> Hi, Eli. I think we'll wrap up now. Just in closing, thank you so much. I mean, the slide presentation was excellent. Thank you for um, allowing us to have that. And um, we'll talk about how we can make it available to others as well. But it was really great and wonderful to hear your story. And I'm sorry that you were so lonely for so long. <laughs> it's okay. I'm still in my head. It's still a lonely place, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that I can't help you with. <laughs> okay. Don't Just, worry. Uh, well, there, I have a piece of mail here for you from the uh, Canadian Revenue Agency <laughs> that you might want to uh, stop by and pick uh, up. <laughs> We're using ink now, so it's it's over. The LLC is all old news, so <laughs> we can toss that one. Um, yeah, no, my pleasure. Anytime you guys want, just let me know. I'm just I'm always so happy to give back. Um, help, you know, if it's have helped others, I don't know, but I'm always happy to be sure. Well, it's very, very, very helpful. I think everyone enjoyed the talk, and there were really some great tidbits of advice for people and and reassurance as well. And that's really important in the entrepreneurial world. Yeah, for sure. Fine. Yeah. All right, take care. Your journey. Bye, Bye. Eli. Yes. Thank you, Eli. Bye. Bye.